Well, today we're going to start a brand new series of messages called The War Within. And um, as we sort of launch into this series of messages that are going to take it through the summer, uh, I just have this real desire for us to begin to realize that Satan sometimes is working in ways that we don't understand, we don't recognize. And sometimes as we begin to look at the ways that he's at work and discouraging us and helping us to withdraw from our faith in God, sometimes as believers today, we just find it too easy to let Satan to have his way. And so today, as we start this series of messages, I want us to begin to re recognize what the face of the enemy looks like and begin to push back what he's trying to do, I think, through his church. And uh, so to hopefully today's message will be helpful to you. Um, I know that our world and our communities, especially here in Canada, are very concerned about the war that's happening between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, even the so-called experts tell us that it could really still yet be the beginning of another world war. And, uh, and that kind of thought is very difficult to kind of take in and think about that possibility. But beginning this weekend, I want us to talk about a war that has been going on even longer. A war that has eternal consequences that are even greater than what we see happening played out with on the landscapes of our world today. And that's that war that rages between, uh, that rages against you and against me, against your family, against my family. It's an unseen war and it's called a spiritual warfare. And in churches sometimes, we just don't even talk about it anymore. But yet, it's a real reality. So today I want us to begin to launch into this series and looking at about this invisible war that rages around us. And I want us to begin to realize that we can win the battle within. And that's probably the greatest battle that you and I will ever struggle against. As a matter of fact, last week when I finished off those messages in Psalm 23, I told you about the three greatest enemies that are warring against you. And we talked about how the Bible calls them the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so this morning as we begin into this message and, and this series about looking at that battle within, I want us to look at, I think, really a very significant problem that we don't think through enough and that we don't consider enough, and that's your very own enemy, your biggest enemy, is right within you. Now, I thought about this morning, I handed everybody a pocket mirror, then have you look at it and say, okay, look to see who your biggest enemy is, then hold it up, you know, and you can see that it's yourself. And so we're going to talk about that battle within, because if we don't learn to push back on what's happening with inside of us, if we don't learn to recognize sometimes that nature with inside of us that wants us to run away from God instead of running to him, if we don't deal with that, then we're going to have all kinds of difficulties in our Christian faith. There are people today who don't go to church anymore, who don't read their Bible anymore, they don't pray anymore, they don't want to hang out with uh, those grumpy church people. Um, they don't want to do any of that. And the reason they don't want to do any of that is because they have fallen prey to this battle that rages within that pulls them away from what God wants them to, to, be, to, to, to do and to be. And so we need to recognize that our greatest, one of our greatest enemies of the three, yes, we could talk about the world, we could talk about the devil, but I want us to talk about our own flesh, our own nature that we struggle against, and how we can win that battle with inside of ourselves. As a pastor, I've had people over the years come to me and say, you know, pastor, I just don't get it. How come all the relationships that I find myself in fall apart and really go nowhere? As a matter of fact, they, all my relationships, they really just kind of suck. They're not, they're not good at all. And how come I go from one relationship, from one bad relationship to another bad relationship to another bad one? Why do I have such rotten luck? And of course, as a pastor, I maybe over the years haven't become very tactful. I usually say, well, what's the common denominator? It's you. You suck. You're the one. You're the one you need to look at. And so sometimes as we look at our struggle and the things that, are, are, that we're dealing with, sometimes we've got to consider the change that needs to happen within us first 
before we will ever be the person that God wants us to be and to have the victory that we know can be ours if we would just begin to look. Back in 1970, which is probably a time when most, <laughs> a lot of you, maybe you weren't even born, I don't know, a lot of you were born way before me, and I was born in 63, try to figure out the math, how old I am, but, um, but back in 1970, there was uh, Walt Kelly, who was a famous cartoonist, and he had a, a pogo cartoon, very well famous, as a matter of fact, his, overall, his cartoon series was most famous for one particular saying. And that saying is this, we have met the enemy and he is us. See, you know it. We have met the enemy and it is us. And I think that's very true. And so this morning as we step into this series, I want to address what I think is one of our biggest problems. Yes, Satan is trying to pull us down. He's trying to trip us up. He is real. He's not, he's not a figment of our imagination. He's absolutely real. And scripture has all kinds of information about who Satan was, where he came from, how he ended up in the position he was in. There's all kinds of things that are said about him, and I don't want to ignore him, but I don't want to give him credit either. But I also want to move on to what I think is one of the, the biggest challenges. It's us and what needs to happen within our own, our own lives. Most of the time, Satan doesn't have to worry about tempting me. I mean, you may be different than I am. Because I'm always messing up my own life enough, enough as it is. He doesn't really need to worry about it. And so we, we have this war that rages within us, this invisible war that's at work within us. And so we're going to start with that first as we address how to be more than conquerors through Christ. More than conquerors. And I don't know about you, I don't want a faith, I don't want a religion that just scrapes by. I want something that makes me more than conquer. I'm a little bit greedy. I don't want to scrape the bottom of the barrel. I want to have the whole barrel. And, uh, and, and I think today in, in the age we live in, it's not enough just to settle into a kind of a Christianity that just skims everything. I'm not interested in skimming. And so we need to be more than conquerors. And so we've got to start looking at how we can be that way. Romans chapter 7 that I read this morning during our scripture reading. What a great passage. I love that passage. It is kind of one of those passages that's gut level. It keeps it real. And I love that because sometimes we can get, you know, we think church is kind of this high church thing where you know, we're talking about principles and precepts that you know, are beyond us. No, they're not. And the Apostle Paul, who I think is one of the greatest people second to Jesus, uh, probably one of the greatest Christians that have lived, the Apostle Paul keeps it real. He keeps it gut level. He has that kind of approach where he doesn't mince his words at all. He's transparent about the struggles that he has as a mature believer, as one of the, the great uh, people of our faith, he's transparent about his struggles and how he's honest with the frustrations and how he feels within his walk with God. And you can hear that frustration as you read Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. That frustration is there, and you might have felt frustration in your walk with God. Maybe you, you are in that same spot where you're thinking, boy, I really want to live for God. But then every day I get up and I say, God, today is going to be a different day. But then you get to the end of the day and you did the same thing you've always done. Nothing changes. But the Apostle Paul tells us that sometimes the war that we're up against that keeps us from making those changes is that war that, battle, that we need to battle within. So today, as we step into this, I, want, I hope you're encouraged because as we read this passage and as we look at it, the Apostle Paul is not a new believer. He's not a novice. He is someone that's mature in his faith. Um, you know, he's the missionary of all the Roman Empire and as I've already said, he's probably the strongest Christian who's ever lived next to Jesus himself. But yet in this passage, he says, sometimes I just can't figure it out. I want to do what I know is right, but I end up doing what is wrong. And this morning, you may be able to relate to that. And so this great saint, this great person of the church is keeping it real for us. And he tells us that you know, we need to recognize some things if we're ever going to win the battle. So looking at this passage, I think the Apostle Paul has given us 
27 things that we're going to know. So we're going to look at six things very quickly this morning about things that will happen to you if you don't recognize the battle and the enemy that is within you. And this passage brings it out very well. And so I want to give you six things, and, we're, and I'm going to go through these quickly this morning. If you have your notes, you can follow along with your notes. As a matter of fact, some of you might have got a note sheet where it says on one side, point seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11. Well, there's not. That's just kind of a, a wrong copying of the notes. It's just six things I want to give you about that come out of this passage that you need to recognize. If you don't recognize it, you're going to end up weak, struggling, and what it means to be a Christian. And we don't need any more of that. We need people who understand that we can be victorious, that we can be conquerors in our faith. No matter what the world throws at us, we don't have to become victims of it. We can be more than conquerors. But if you don't recognize these, six, these things, then you're going to face the consequences of it. So let's go through this passage this morning. Let me give you six things, and we'll go through it very quickly. Number one, the first thing you're going to come up against if you don't recognize it, and if you don't deal with the battle that rages within, is confusion. It's, it's interesting to me how the enemy wants to confuse us. And if it can get you confused, then you say, why bother? Why even go to church? I'm so confused about it. Why even, why even go? Or why read my Bible? Or why, why even think about a God who loves me? I'm just so confused. And so one of the things that comes out of here, and one of the first things that, that's going to happen when you try to grow spiritually and become more mature in your faith, one of the first battles you're going to come up against is, is you need to recognize that you're going to become confused if you try to live this Christian life in your own power. You're going to end up confused if you try to live this Christian life in your own power. Notice in verse 15, he says, I don't understand myself. I mean, I could have written this, all right? This could have been, this could have been the scripture according to Mark here, all right? Um, I could have written this. I don't understand myself because that's exactly the way I feel a lot of days. He says, I don't understand myself at all for I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I don't want, I do what I don't want to do, what I hate. And one of the things that we see come out of this is this confusion where he didn't understand himself. Paul is show, trying to show us that if you don't recognize this battle within, you're going to become confused if you don't recognize that the only way you're going to win this battle is not in your own strength, but it's in the strength of, God, of, of the Holy Spirit. So as we begin to look at this passage, one of the things I want you to notice here is the number of times that Paul uses the word I. It's really quite profound. Matter of fact, when you look down through the passage I gave you this morning, there are 41 times in these 12 verses that it's I, or me, or my. And sometimes as we begin to live our Christian lives today, we are so focused on what I can do, or what I want, or focused on me, and what are the benefits for me? What about me? And what about my rights? We live in a culture where sometimes, and we even try to live our Christian faith that way, where we, I, tries to do what needs to be done, and I can't do it. And as you begin to look at this passage, you'll see um, in those, those verses that the word I is used 27 times. He used the word my six times. He used the word me six times. He used the word myself two times, 41 times in all. Hear me when I say this. Some people are confused and struggling with their faith today because they're trying to live it in their own strength. They're saying, how can I do this? And frankly, this morning, I can't. I can't. But the more you try to rely on yourself to get the job done and to live out your faith, the more confused you will be, and the less you will understand about how to win this battle. Paul, that great man of God, had an eye problem, not E-Y-E. I don't think he had cataracts, or maybe he did, I don't know. But he had an eye problem, the letter I. And I wonder if some of us today as believers were so busy trying to live out our Christianity ourselves and our own power that we end up getting discouraged 
And we'll talk about that in a moment. And confused. As I read this passage, I don't know how you are, but it encourages me. Even Paul, the greatest mis- the saint there was, even Paul struggled with this. And so I want to say to you this morning that one of the first things that you will come up against if you, when you begin to fight this battle within is that you will get confused if you think you can fight that battle in your own strength. Some of us figure if I have enough willpower, I can overcome. There's a Greek word for that, baloney. All right? It doesn't work that way, folks. We're fighting a spiritual battle. You don't have it. I don't have it. And people today are getting discouraged about Christianity, getting discouraged about God, because on one hand, they're trying to do it themselves in their own willpower and forgetting about the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual battle. And when you try to fight it on your own, you'll get confused, and you'll even give up. And there are people today who no longer sit in our churches, who no longer read their Bibles, no longer even profess the name of Jesus, because they tried for such a long time, I, I, I. And they forgot about where the real power is. That's in the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing that Paul came up again and realized that Unless I begin to recognize this battle within me, not only will I experience confusion, but number two, guilt and shame. I don't have time to go into it. Both of those things are a little bit different. But I want to simply want to say this this morning. God doesn't want you going around your, in your life with a bunch of guilt and shame hanging over the top of you. And that's what happens when you try to fight a spiritual battle with human tools like willpower. In verse 16, he says, I know perfectly well what I'm doing is wrong. How many of us, we know perfectly well sometimes what we're doing is wrong, but we do it anyway. And then we carry that guilt and shame because we know what we're doing. It's interesting to me that, matter of fact, in that verse, he says, he goes on and he says, and my bad conscience proves that I agree with these laws that I am breaking. Now notice that word conscience there. What's he saying on that conscience? Matter of fact, I encourage you, if you circle anything in your Bible, circle that word conscience, because um, I don't know if you know where that word comes from. It's a Latin word. It comes from the word, two words, actually. It means the word con, which means with in Latin, and also science, which in Latin means knowledge. And so when you put those two things together, the word conscience means you do something with full knowledge that you know you're doing it. And because we know we're doing wrong, we end up with a bad conscience. We know what we're doing is wrong. And let me just say this this morning. Sometimes the contemporary believer of today, of the 21st century, we know we're breaking God's law. We know we're we're into things we shouldn't be into. We're saying things we shouldn't be saying. We're doing things we shouldn't be doing. We're looking at things we shouldn't be looking at on the internet where our thought life is in a place where it shouldn't be, but we go ahead and we do it anyway, and we do it with full knowledge that we know what we're doing is wrong, but we do it anyway. Come on. And we have a bad conscience until that conscience becomes seared. So let's not kid ourselves today. We know what we're doing, but we do it anyway. We know we shouldn't watch it, but we watch it anyway. We know we shouldn't say it, but we say it anyway. And we do it with full knowledge. And therefore, we have guilt that comes our way. And that guilt will wear us down, will wear us out, and will beat us up. Number three, Paul says if... As you face that battle within, if, you're not, if you don't recognize what the war is all about, now the third thing that's going to happen is you're going to have compulsions and addictions. What is that? Compulsions and addictions. In other words, Paul is saying that if you don't deal with it and if you don't sort of nip it, then it becomes a habit in your life. Next thing you know, you're doing something that becomes a habit in your life. You become hot-tempered. And you think, well, I can't deal with my temper. It's just the way I'm born. I've always had a hot temper. Again, that Greek word fits here. And that Greek word is baloney. All right? You're catching on. You're catching on. 
And so we need to realize that when you begin to do these things, you, it begins to become a habit in your life, and you think you can't stop doing it, but you really can. And, but it does become a habit. It becomes a compulsion, becomes an addiction, becomes something you begin to repeat over and over. I can't tell you the number of people who said to me, I just can't get free from pornography. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can be free. You can be more than free. But the problem is, is that it's become an addiction in your life, become a compulsion that you think you can't live without. Paul says this in the next verse. He says, if I do these bad things enough, I get addicted to them. I'm reading from the Living Bible. Paul says, even there, he says, I get addicted to them. And that's what happens when we begin to do wrong things, say wrong things. We may have the best of intentions, but we somehow become pulled down by them over and over again. They become habits in our life, and they ruin us, and they hurt us. You and I this morning need to recognize that you and I were built with a human nature, a human nature that has fallen, and a nature that has sin in it. You and I have a natural inclination to do what's wrong. Hear me when I say this. When... From the day that you're born to the day that you go to be with the Lord, hopefully, you are struggling with that sinful nature. You, you would rather do something. It's easier for you to do something wrong than it is to do something right. You ever notice that in life? It's easier to do something wrong. And you and I have a natural resistance to doing the right thing. You and I, sometimes we don't like to do the right thing. It's you and I would rather do the easy thing. We would rather do the popular thing. We would rather do the comfortable thing. You and I would rather do the thing that makes us the most happy, but it may not be with the thing that's the most honoring to the Lord. You and I have that human nature that many times just wants to pull us down. And so we need to recognize that as we deal with that human nature and when we begin to give ourselves over to uh, sin long enough, it can be begin to form habits and addictions in our life, and it becomes hard to break. And some folks listen to our broadcast this morning, some of us here in the service today, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you wake up in the morning, you say, today I'm going to be free from this. But then that addiction pulls you down. That compulsion pulls you back into its trap. And you are more discouraged than ever before. You can be free, but you can't do it in your own willpower. You can't do it in your own strength. It's only God that can help you to be more than a conqueror. So Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying these things are happening to you if you don't recognize this battle within you, if you don't recognize the addictions that are taking place. The fourth thing he says is that then you're going to start finding yourself condemning yourself. Now, how many of you have a master's in condemning yourself? All right? You've got a doctorate in that area. No one needs to, no one needs to tell you how to condemn yourself because you do it every day. You got a degree in it. And that's what happens when sin begins to find its way into your life. Next thing you know, you begin to discover how really rotten you are, and you begin to become a pro at putting yourself down. Folks, that's what sin does. It tells you that you're not worthy it tells you that you're no good. It tells you that you'll never be free. And I'm going to come to it later, but all of that is lie, lie, lie. But it's still the battle we're up against. Many of you say, well, I keep losing my temper. I keep saying mean things. I still have the same thoughts. I'm, I'm no good. I'm junk. Why would God even want to have anything to do with me? Why even call myself a Christian? And next thing you know, they go on and on, blah, 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 how bad they are. And that does not come from God, folks. When you begin to accuse yourself and condemn yourself, that comes straight from the pit of hell itself. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hear me when I say that. That does not come from God. And so don't repeat it, especially in my company, because <laughs> I don't believe it. But yet, that's what we do to ourselves. We start condemning ourselves because we don't understand this spiritual battle where Satan is at work. In verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, he says, I know I'm rotten inside as far as my old sinful nature is concerned. When I read that, I'm thinking, well, who told him that he was so rotten? 
But yet, he's telling himself that. He's putting himself down. He's condemning himself. God never said that to him. But yet, that's the way he feels. Is that the way you feel this morning? Do you feel like you're not worthy? Are you putting yourself down? Don't do it. God loves you so much. He has an incredible plan he wants to work out, but he can't because we're so busy beating ourselves up. Let us be more than conquerors, and let's put aside that self-condemnation. Number five, the fifth thing the Apostle Paul says that will come into your life as you begin to struggle with this is frustration. And frustration is the, the mark of a Christian who's trying to live on their own power instead of God's power. Frustration is what you'll get about your faith when you begin to do things your way instead of leaning on the strength that God wants to give you. Frustration. How many people are frustrated today with their Christianity? Let's be honest. Frustrated with Christianity, frustrated with the church, frustrated with God, but it's not God's fault. God says, I have everything that you need, but your frustration doesn't come from me. Your frustration comes for the, for the, because of the battle that rages within you. Paul even says it in the next verse, in verse 18, he says, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do what is right. Feel the frustration in his voice? Feel what he's going through? Some of you may feel that way today. You're frustrated with, with Christianity. And he goes on, he talks about how he does things anyway, even though he shouldn't do it. And he says, sin has me in its evil grasp. The Bible calls all of that the law of sin or the law of, uh, in, of sin. And the law of sin is kind of like the law of gravity. You know, someday when you get up and you decide, hey, I'm going to ignore the law of gravity and I'm going to go to the top of the building, I'm going to jump off and I'm going to flap my wings, I'm going to be the first human to fly. All right, I don't recommend this. All right. But if you try to ignore the law of gravity and go up on top of the building and you try to jump off and be that first human to fly and you flap your arms, the law of gravity is going to take over. The law of sin is its counterpart, its spiritual counterpart, is that if you ignore sin, sin will pull you down. It will cause you to be frustrated and you, you will not be able to live victorious in your life. And so this morning, the battle that rages within every one of us if we don't recognize it, we will become frustrated. And so this morning, if you're frustrated in your Christianity, that doesn't come from God. That frustration you're feeling or you're sensing, the angst that you have, oh boy, why do I even need to go to church? You know, why do I even need to read my Bible? That angst that you're feeling doesn't come from God. That comes from that battle, that flesh, that carnality within all of us that doesn't naturally want to do what God wants us to do. It wants to do the opposite. And if you're not aware of that, where that frustration is coming from, you're going to walk away from the greatest truth you could ever surrender yourself to. And finally this morning, the last thing, is that you will experience discouragement and despair. Discouragement and despair. Paul was getting so discouraged from the war that was going on inside of him. And you may be feeling the same way. He says in that passage, reading from the Living Bible, he says, it seems to be a fact of life. In other words, I'm giving up on this. I can't beat it. And he became discouraged and began to despair. He says, it seems to be the fact of life. What I, what I want to do, I don't end up doing. And the thing that I don't want to do, I end up doing. It's just, oh, why even bother? And so he began to become discouraged and despaired. And again, that's what that battle does if you don't recognize it. That rages within every single one of us. This morning I close with this. As you think about these things that can come your way because you don't recognize it, I want you to recognize that you can be more than a conqueror. How do you become that conqueror? Let me close with this very quickly. Number one, you need to deepen your understanding of Christ. You may be here this morning, you've already placed your faith in Christ, but you've got to go deeper. 
You can't be living a shallow, superficial Christian life and expect to be victorious. It doesn't happen that way. You need, you need to go deeper on what Christ did for you and did it and there on the cross. He doesn't want just to be a resident in your life. He wants to be the president of your life. And he doesn't just want to take up space in your life. The Holy Spirit wants to be in charge of your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. Number one, you've got to go deeper in your faith. Number two, you need to st detect and disarm the lie that you're believing. Today, if you're going to become and win this battle that, w that rages within you, you've got to detect the lie that you're believing in. Some of you are believing the lie. I'm not worthy. Why would God love me? Folks, that's a lie. Detect that lie. Disarm that lie. Come against it in the name of Jesus. And realize that you are a child of the king. You've put your faith in him. You lift your chin up. And you begin to become that victorious conqueror. Not in your own willpower. Not in your own strength. But through the strength God wants to give you. And we're going to talk about that more through the series. But you, it begins by detecting and disarming the lie that you're believing in. And we, we need to do that. The number one way that Satan messes up your life is by suggesting lies to you, and we take it in, hook, line, and sinker. Oh, I can't beat this. It's too strong in my life. I'll never find someone who loves me. I'm not lovable. That's a lie. Folks, stop believing the lies around us. And we tell ourselves lies all the time. Matter of fact, you know, uh, sometimes even when I'm counseling people, people say, well, I'm not really the problem. And I'll say, really? So your finances are bad, but you're not the problem. Your, your marriage life is bad, but you're not the problem. Your kids won't talk to you, but you're not the problem. It's amazing how we lie to ourselves. I'm losing my temper, but it's not my fault. If it wasn't for that crazy neighbor I have next door, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be like this. Oh, it's the workplace. Oh, if I could just find a different place to work. See what I mean? In every aspect of life, we're believing the lie that it's someone else's fault. But we need to detect the lie that's being told to us and push against it. And finally this morning, I must declare whatever it is that I'm struggling with, whatever lie it is that you're believing for yourself, you need to declare it and confess it. You need to declare your struggle to someone else publicly. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that God can heal you. When a believing person prays, great things happen. In other words, not only confess it to God, sometimes we need to confess to each other and pray for each other so that we will be healed. This morning, I am convinced that here through Spotlight Church, I will do everything I can as your pastor to realize that you do not need to scrape the bottom of your barrel when it comes to your walk with God. He has something mighty in store for you. And he needs us to recognize how we become the victim of these, uh, this battle that rages within our own flesh. And we don't recognize it. Paul, through this passage, is saying, here, here's what it's doing to you. Do you recognize it? Do you recognize it? Or are you just going on as if it doesn't exist? And someday, you'll pay the consequences for that, if not today. This morning, God wants to do so much. And so this invisible war that rages, we're going to do everything we can to become a people who get up and get dressed every day not just to do the things of this world, but get dressed with a spiritual armor so that we can push back on the enemy. Amen? Amen? Push back on the enemy. Stop believing the lie. God loves you. And even in all the people we meet, no matter how messed up their lives may look, folks, don't give up on people. But begin to believe that they are made in the image of God and he has a great plan he wants to unfold. Stop believing the lie. Let's stand together in closing. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for a great day of worshiping you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for just preserving 
even the words of great saints like Apostle Paul and reminding us that sometimes we think we have to be absolutely perfect. But Lord, that's not what is needed. What's needed is just that raw faith that's put in you and that trusts you, that believes you. And so, Father, this morning for every person that's here today, probably the greatest question, Lord, I'm, I'm, I want you to speak to them about is, is there a lie that they're believing? Help them to detect that lie and disarm it and to begin to become a conqueror over it. Lord, set them free today. Set them free through your power and in your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing.